please join me in welcoming Mr. Richard Goida AO to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger, and good afternoon, everyone, and it's great to be here. Can I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wajak Noongar people, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And a few other, <coughs> excuse me, acknowledgements in the room today. My wonderful wife, Janine, who's here. Thank you for your support. <laughs> How good's that? Um, the Lord Mayor, Baz, great to see you. Uh, Larry Lopez, I'm looking forward to our engagement shortly, to John Kluwer. Uh, and... Um, Evan, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a failure, um, and I apologise, and it's easy to see you in the room. Um, uh, so, two stories for you, Evan. I was, this, this is all my doing this speech. I was talking to someone last night. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going through my speech for tomorrow. And they said, why didn't you just do chat GPT? 80% of it would be right, and then you, all you have to do is, I didn't even think about that. But I'll tell you a story, Evan. Um, Back in 98, I was lucky enough to go to Harvard Business School and did the advanced management program at Harvard. And we had a week on entrepreneurship. <clears throat> and uh, we did this class. I'm a country boy. Um, and we did this class with this new innovation called satellite navigation. And, you know, I'm a country boy. I, I know where I'm going. I know where north, east, west, south. I know, read a map. And... Uh, Anyway, they sort of asked us at the end of this class what we thought about this innovative thing called satellite navigation. And I put my hand up. I said, I think it's complete rubbish. It'll never happen. <laughs> so that's how good I am, Evan, I tell you. Um, and uh, now without SatNav, I'm done. Um, uh, there's a lot of topics that Roger said I'm going to cover today. Whether I get them all done, time will tell. But... Um, uh, hopefully we can cover stuff off in, in Q&A. I did want to acknowledge my Woodside colleagues who are here. Thank you for your support. Um, my Qantas colleagues, if any of you have problems with missing baggage or uh, flight rebookings, please contact them, not me. Uh, um, and my colleagues from Telethon, and I'm very proud of the Telethon connection, and uh, Mark McCrory and the team at Telethon, um, uh, we had a beneficiaries breakfast that Basil hosted on Friday and we gave $71 million to organisations across Western Australia that need the support of the West Australian community and it's something that we should all be really proud of, I think, Telethon. Anyway, the world is an interesting and volatile place right now and I feel like I've been saying that for every speech I've given in the last 20 years but never has it been more true. We saw 12 months post the pandemic, sort of. It was the 3rd of March last year when the West Australian border finally opened. So it's literally 12 months ago um, that we did that. Where Russia's invaded the Ukraine. Uh, China is uh, flexing its muscles. Climate change is a concern to all of us. Energy security is a concern to all of us, or should be. We've got... Um, what's going on in banking around the world with Silicon Valley Bank, um, with what's happened with Credit Suisse, uh, and I think the deal for UBS to buy Credit Suisse was done in literally 72 hours. Um, and then we've got St Kilda, North Melbourne and Essendon, two and zero, and Fremantle zero and two, and it's a terrible start to the year. And in that environment, everyone has a voice. And so I think in many ways um, change and leadership is harder than it's ever been and we need it now more than ever. I've always said that leaders should lead, understanding that mistakes will be made and there are consequences for decisions that work or don't work. And Gil McLaughlin reminded me on the weekend that sometimes you have to lose to win. But look how we crave leadership through the pandemic. You know, these knockabout Australians, these confident Australians who just did everything we were asked to do, um, sort of, you know, we walked on the right side of the street, we wore our mask, we kept a metre and 0.5. It was unbelievable, in my view, how we just complied. 
And there's a bit of a lesson in that, and I think it applies to, to, to markets and it certainly applies to the way we live, which is fear and greed drive a lot. And fear was what drove a lot of behaviour through COVID. There's not a cookie cutter for effective leadership. I'm really fortunate now to work with many, but three outstanding leaders in Alan Joyce, Meg O'Neill and Gillan McLaughlin. They're all incredibly effective and they're all incredibly different, but they do have some common traits. They're hardworking, they're smart, they're resilient, they build teams, they have intuition, they're prepared to make decisions without perfect information and they're passionate and they want to win. So Friday night, we're at home, Janine and I at home, we had visitors for dinner. I was such good company on Friday night. So firstly, Jim, our plumber, contacted me and they had problems with their uh, Qantas flights with Qatar and I was trying to support, fix out, fix with Janelle's help, Jim's flights to Munich, uh, which is what you do on a Friday night, isn't it? And then the next thing I'm watching the football and the football goes dark and the lights have gone out at the Gabba. And I sent Gil McLaughlin a text, basically said, are you on this? And I got instantly a response back, yep. So I knew at that point that at least I didn't have to worry about what was gonna happen at the Gabba. The other thing about it is Gil's going. Gil's announced that he'll retire sometime this year. So he's got every reason actually to be out on a Friday night um, having a few beers with him. He was on it, the AFL team was on it, and to me that was great leadership, that um, we dealt with the issues that came up on Friday night. So they are passionate and they want to win. There's times when you actually know you're a leader. My first six months as CEO of West Farmers, I thought this is so good. I just loved every day going to work. There were no issues, there were no crises. The team came to me with great thoughts and ideas and it's just rubber stamp, yeah, we'll do that, yeah, it's fine. Then we had an issue. And that was when everyone came to my office and told me what they thought we should do and then walked out. And everyone had a different view. And that's when as a leader, sometimes you've got to make a decision, you've got to make a call. And that's when leadership really comes to the fore. In my experience, good leaders share the credit and they accept the blame. I love my time at West Farm as a CEO. It was a great company, great values, great people, a fantastic board that was supportive, knew that I and the team would make mistakes, but hopefully we'd be better for it. They had a long-term view on the future. There were no politics at play. And I got to do some wonderful things with great people. Um, but Janine would say I was away for more than half a year and that that was a bit of a chore for her <laughs> from time to time. So the move to non-executive life, for me, I was ready for it in 2017. I was fortunate to get some great opportunities and I was fortunate to be asked to be chair of some great organisations. So what's changed since I retired in 2017 to now? Firstly, I think all our stakeholders are more demanding and for good reason, but they are more demanding. The next three days I've got in Sydney and Melbourne and Sydney talking to our shareholders at Woodside about ESG matters and, it, and they worry about that. The regulatory environment has become much, much uh, tighter and shareholders uh, want more, but they also actually want sustainable returns. And our obligations as directors are more complex. Sarbanes-Oxley, are any of you fortunate enough to have um, listed companies in the US and have to understand Sarbanes-Oxley? I tell you, that is seriously a serious compliance thing. Uh, and there's more committees now than there ever were. And it's actually hard to please everyone. In fact, you can't. So I'll talk to shareholders over the next few days about the Woodside remuneration report. And there's some shareholders who will say to me, unless your measure for corporate performance is total shareholder return, we won't vote for your re remuneration report. And there'll be some others who say, unless your measure is return on equity, we won't vote for you. So we can't please them all. We just have to do what we think is right. So, you know, as a board, we need to do what we think's right and we need to be confident 
that we're acting in the best interests as uh, for the company. It's harder as a non-exec. By definition, we are non-executive. And that's why your selection of <coughs> CEO is so important, as is openness and trust around a board table. So I'm now going to head to the global stage and I'll come back to leadership in a minute. As I said at the start, it's complex. So I want you now just to put yourself in the position, let's say you want to be Prime Minister for a day. A few nods, not a lot, probably wisely. It's complex. So first meeting of the day is your Defence and National Security Advisors, as it should be. And they walk in and they explain to you why we need to spend up to $368 billion buying a few submarines. They exit. The next meeting is a bunch of business leaders. Oh my God, business leaders, they always want something. They walk in and they tell you, China is our most important trading nation. Please don't do anything that's going to upset China. Morning tea, the Greens walk in. And they tell you they don't want any new coal or gas developments in this country. They walk out and then the national energy market operator walks in and says that without some more gas, we're going to have power failures on the east coast in the decades ahead. It's a good day so far. And then the treasurer walks in. Well, we've got to take notice of the treasurer. And he, said, he says that with the submarines, the NDIS and other commitments, we've got a significant structural fiscal deficit. Without higher taxes or greater wealth creation through supporting the industries that are generating wealth in this country, i.e. liquid natural gas, iron ore, coal, farming products, uh, we're buggered. And then uh, on the day that the government announces the 43% emissions reduction target, which is a great target, um, is the same day that we announce as a country how well we're going as exporters because we've got record LNG, record coal, record iron ore and record agricultural exports. So how are you going as Prime Minister and where are you going to land on each one of those things? Um, it's easy, I think, to talk about the challenges, it's much harder to come up with solutions. So my views on some of these things, firstly, you know, you wear hats, obviously. We're a country rich with energy, natural resources and well-educated people, and we should take advantage of that. Climate change is real, it's serious. The world needs a plan and we need to be ambitious and we then need to stick to the plan. National security is not negotiable, we need a plan. And then what? And that the video, uh, John, that you put up earlier uh, on how Israel has gone, what's our plan post LNG, post iron ore, post um, coal exports? What are we going to do to take advantage of the incredible natural resources and opportunities this country has to create wealth and prosperity and a high living standard for our kids in the future. Let's not kid ourselves now though, because at the moment we don't have that. And also let's not kid ourselves on a few other things. What's, what, what's the share of global emissions coming from Australia at the moment? Anthony knows, I know that. It's 1.2 to 1.3% of global emissions. Let's not kid ourselves that Australia on its own is gonna save the world. We need to be as good as any country. We need to be better than any country. We need to be a strong advocate, but we're not gonna save it on our own. <coughs> um, and as a country, we shouldn't be exporting industries to other countries that will have higher emissions than we would have through well-managed companies here. I think, as I said, we, we have incredible opportunities, whether it's education, whether it's medical research, whether it's agriculture, there's a whole lot that we should be looking at in countries like Israel to ensure that we have an incredible future. But we can also, in my view, be a significant part of the solution on climate change. And with my Woodside hat on, I'd say gas is important, valuable and strategic in doing that. Just ask the leaders in Japan, Korea and other countries, Timor, for example, how important that is. Now, I've got off my uh, high horse, I'll come back to leadership. Leadership 
gets really tested when things come along that you don't expect. And clearly a pandemic, a global pandemic, was one of those things. When there's crisis or rapid change, that's when real leaders stand up. At Qantas, um, I was at, some of you have heard me say this before, I was outside Janine's brother's place in Wembley on the 5th of January in 2020 when I got a phone call from Alan Joyce. And he said, Richard, there's something going on in Wuhan in China and I'm a bit worried it's a bit like SARS. So I'm going to stand up the crisis committee. This is the 5th of January. The Prime Minister spoke to us on, I think, the 23rd or the 26th of January that year. And I said, oh, sure, Alan, keep me informed. That was the first I heard of of what became COVID. And I'd argue that every day then through till May that year was exponentially worse. Now, for Qantas, it was our very survival. And the actions Alan and his team took meant the airline survived and will thrive coming out of it. Now, we haven't been perfect, but we had to survive. The best, the best week we had through that period in 2020 in terms of cash burn, the best week we had was burning $40 million of cash. Do the maths, Shane. 52 weeks in a year, 40 million dollars a week is two billion dollars of cash gone in a year in our best week in our best week that's what we were looking into in the AFL we played round one some of you remember West Coast played Melbourne in a in a very strange environment the last game of the day and then we called the season off and we didn't resume until May in 2020 in the meantime we had a billion dollar hole in a business uh, that had um, th about that much in terms of outgoings. Gill and the team did an incredible job with our supporters, our sponsors, our media partners, and then managed to get an AFL season away in 2020 through incredible agility, getting teams out of Melbourne in hours, literally hours, teams onto planes and out and up to Queensland because borders were going to be closed. And they're not decisions where you make with perfect information. They're decisions you make through intuition and you, you make a decision. But we got the year away and it was incredible. The key thing to me about that leadership was it was decisive. And prepared, and, and Gil and Alan were prepared to take risks. But in the end, it worked out well for them. But they also knew that it may not, uh, but way better to make a decision than not to make a decision. So now, <clears throat> coming back to Australia, I think as a country, we've got to make some decisions and choices to maintain the, the, as I said, the envious lifestyle that we currently have. But I've got a few observations to make and they're probably those of a 63-year-old former CEO who's now sitting around a boardroom table. Firstly, we've got to be able to pay for the things that we want, otherwise our living standards will fall. Just like at home, we have to prioritise the things we want to spend on. I have this great conversation with our kids who are now going through interest rates going up and three of our four children have mortgages. So they get sick of me saying, how many cups of coffee do you have a day? Two, five dollars a cup of coffee, that's ten dollars a day. 365 days a year, that's $3,650 of post-tax income times two, if you're a couple. That's over $7,000 of pre-tax income you're spending on coffee. You might have to make a decision on that. Um, and what about your phone? <laughs> anyway, that's when, they, that's when I lose them. <laughs> Post-pandemic, money has been free and cheap. It's not. Money's been unlimited. It's not. We need to get to work. There's incredible opportunities, but only if we get to them before others do. I don't know how we can be contemplating as a nation working less for more money without productivity improvements. I don't see how we can have debt as a nation that doesn't have to be repaid. And I think we need leaders who will tell it 
as it is and give us a way forward, even if it's not the way forward everyone wants. I hope we don't have to endure a significant economic downturn to face into some of the challenges we have and take advantages of, advantage of some of the opportunities we have. But time will tell. Because these things, the NDIS, our national security, the lifestyle that we all enjoy, have to be paid for. So, let us get things done, sometimes quietly. This room is full of leaders. They don't sit on the sidelines and criticise, they actually get things done. The 107 beneficiary groups that Telethon funded on, on Friday are run by people who are leaders who do an incredible job in our community and we should be grateful for their leadership. We all have a role as leaders and it's important we get on with it. Thank you very much. How are we going, Larry? <clears throat> I said to John earlier, Larry, John, I'm on an aeroplane this afternoon, and one thing I can't do with Qantas is holding his whole planes back. <laughs> oh, come on. Thank you very much. Um, and it's kind of nice to be on this side and not having to answer questions after the last two weeks. So, um, you know, and I, I, have this, I have to just tell a, a Richard Gordon story because I think, think I have this really fond memory. I, I had retired from a company that will go unnamed and moved to Australia for a better life. I wanted to spend more time with my children. And at the time, you were the uh, uh, running West Farmers. And I have these really great memories of you and Janine manning the sausage sizzle at the footy games. And I thought, you know, that is, that's what a real leader does and somebody who has some balance in their life, which, which is what I had come to Australia seeking. So... I, that, that was a, a great lesson for me. But I think about what you've done the last two or three years, and I couldn't imagine you were going to pick the three hardest companies to be chair of, a uh, fossil fuels company, a, a football uh, organization, and Qantas coming to the pandemic and, and all the things around fossil fuels. Personally, I mean, how can you be so resilient? Well, how's, Positive. My but, how's my judgment first? Yeah, well, that, that, we're not going to go there. Uh, you are a Docker supporter, so... Uh, <laughs> but it, but it, it, seriously, I mean, that, that, that's got to be hard. How, how do you stay up and stay positive and keep all your, your leaders motivated? Uh, because, I, I mean, firstly, I love what I do. Yeah. Uh, and I actually... Uh, I love working with those organisations. And we have our challenges. Uh, but we're facing into the challenges. And, and I like being part of a solution, I always have. Uh, and like, I like working with great people. And I've been, the one thing, one decision I made, a very good decision I made was to marry Janine, Larry. So that, that's helped. I've heard that. <coughs> um, that's helped. Uh, and, you know, the, I said earlier that that period in COVID in the first part of 2020 was challenging. And a lot of people in this room will have found it. You know, I'm looking at, at, at Bronte and it was a tough time. And a lot of people, you know, Dean Tanner, footy teams, um, a lot of people didn't know where it was all going to head to. But at least I could have conversations with people that could potentially have some influence. And so I, I felt privileged to be in that position, Larry. And I, and I, I still do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do these things forever. I need to. I, well, Janine, I've got a beautiful farm and I need to go and run that one day, but, uh, uh, well, no, no, I won't run it because I'm not good enough to run it, but I'll go up and round up some sheep or something. But, <laughs> but while I can make a contribution, I love doing it. So, I mean, aside from all the big pig, and you, you know, I think you painted a pretty fair picture of, of all the turmoil the world's on, but what's your sense, could Australia survive another global shock like the pandemic? I mean, uh, we have it so lucky yeah. here in so many ways, but... Yeah, I, I, I said the last things I did in my speech then because I just think they sort of need to be said. Um, and Janine will tell you that my kids get sick of me telling them to, you know, manage their budget and do those sort of things. But I, I think as a nation we have to do it. But I, I'd want people walking out of here being incredibly optimistic about this country. 
I do think through the global financial crisis and now a pandemic, um, to a degree we don't have a spare tyre anymore. You know, we, we've, I think we've got, you know, we've got less fat now and I think we've got to face into a few things and make sure we get it right as we go forward. Um, hopefully we don't have another shock, but Alan Joyce has been CEO of Qantas for, it'll be coming up 15 years soon, and he reckons there's one every five years because he's had a few in his okay. time. So there'll be more come along and, you know, you, you're seeing now from a distance what's going on in, in the banking world. And you and I both know that hopefully the central banks will manage that well. Um, but we're only ever a crisis of confidence away from another significant downturn. I certainly, uh, <laughs> I wish I was a little farther away from that than I am, but yeah. um, in any case. So when, you know, I'm gonna just shift gears a little bit. You know, you talked a lot about Australia only being, you know, 1.2% of global emissions, but at the same token, a big part of our economy is tied to, to either resources or is in very, um, are, are industries that are huge emitters, particularly steel. Um, so, you know, how do we come out of this? How do we, we adjust the economy away from fossil fuels? And I look, I, I have the good fortune to work with a lot of the great people at Woodside. So I know that the Woodside's doing a great job of future thinking. But just as the Australian economy as a whole, there's some big challenges there of the, the, the key elements that underpin this economy. Yeah, but I, I, Larry, I think we've got a plan, and I think um, the safeguard mechanism, the 43%, I think we're putting uh, the, the foundations in for a plan. You're right. We, um, you know, we export about a billion tonnes of iron ore, and that that has a significant global um, contribution to greenhouse gases, uh, but. Uh, but the world, the, the way of manufacturing steel is not going to change rapidly. Maybe it is, based on what uh, future, uh, Fortescue Future Industries said last week, who knows. Um, uh, people are going to want power, um, but we need to unleash the creative capabilities of this country, and it's great to see the um, people with Professor Lynn Beasley up, up there who are, who are going to be part of the solution. I, I think, Larry, we all have a role to play. I'm a, I'm a huge believer that technology is going to help us and that we will make some significant advancements as we go along. And, um, but I also think that right now people also want secure and stable and affordable energy and not just in Australia but globally. So we're going to have to navigate our way through that. But, you know, when I go back to when I was at Harvard in, in 98 and satellite technology, you know, satellite um, navigation was an idea. Um, electric cars were um, not even on the, on the landscape then. So I think we're making great progress. I'm confident we'll continue to make great progress because we're agitating for it. And Australians are good agitators. And we've got incredible education here. So, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I also think we've got to be pragmatic on the way. Great, thanks. So and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but I think a lot of us are kind of bringing up. You know, you have to, companies have to survive. And, and companies are in the business of making money. And how hard was it at Qantas, when you have so many different stakeholders, um, to make some of the hard decisions? And I, I understand burning $40 million in cash in a good week is, is tough. Yeah. But, I mean, were you ever at risk of, of alienating one of your most important stakeholders, which oh. are the passengers? And, and how, I mean, how hard was that? I, I, that I, balance? I think we almost alienated everyone um, uh, through the process. But, you know, we went into COVID with 30,000 people. And um, fortunately, we had a balance sheet when we went in. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, aircraft that um, we owned and we had supportive financiers. Um, but don't forget Virgin went broke through that period, mm. leaving creditors, bondholders, um, you know, with nothing. Um, so um, 
we had to do, and, and, and in January 2020, no one had perfect foresight. As I said, every day was worse. So we didn't know how long this was going to go. And through that period when we kept, you know, people say, you guys got a lot of government support. We got government support to keep um, air travel going when there were no customers. So we were flying planes between Sydney and Perth and Melbourne and places basically with empty. freight, but, yeah. but empty, unless someone was crazy enough to try and cross borders. <laughs> That's another story, isn't it, Anthony? Um, uh, so <clears throat> um, we didn't know how bad this was going to be. And, and we couldn't in 2020 raise equity. We raised equity in 21, but uh, no one had an idea on the future in 2020. So, so we had to do whatever we did. And we, we um, fortunately the government supported us through um, uh, JobKeeper and things like that. But basically we had to stand down 20,000 employees because otherwise we would have gone broke like, like Virgin did. Um, so it was, it was, it was, there were tough decisions. And then coming back, the reason I made the comment earlier about it's 12 months since the West Australian border opened is because then everyone wanted us to be as good as we were pre-COVID <laughs> on the first day back and... Guilty and we, as charged. And we weren't, um, and some of the, you know, a lot of that's, that's on us. But I was saying earlier to, to Roger, you know, we, we're still getting flight cas cancellations out of Sydney, but a lot of that's because air services in Sydney has got an absenteeism issue and so we get, our, our movements get reduced in 25 of the days, 25 days in February, Air Services Australia reduced our movements in and out of Sydney. So we had to cancel flights, but when Qantas cancels a flight, it doesn't come up, oh, Air Services Australia apologises for cancelling, it's Qantas. Uh, and so it's on us, but that's fine because our brand is such a great brand. So, you know, we'll work hard to, to get the trust back. And, I mean, I fly a lot, and I, I'm actually surprised by how, how, my, how quickly it's turned around for the good. Is this, has this exceeded your expectations, not just at Qantas, but also with the AFL, yeah. um, that we could make such, that it would be, I, I would have expected a much longer tail in terms of things coming back. Yeah, so we've had record crowds of the first two rounds of AFL games this year. And it just says, I think, people want to get on with their lives. Uh, again, I was saying at our table, I, I think at least for a period of time, travel is higher on the hierarchy of needs. I think people are saying, people like me are saying, I had three years locked up. I lost three years opportunity to travel. I'm not going to lose the next... So I'm not going to defer travel. I'm taking the chance. I'm going to Israel in July. I can't wait. Um, and uh, um, so I, I think we've bounced back. I think what my, my caution at the moment is that there's instability in the world and because of the huge amounts of liquidity that were thrown, and, and, and you know this, were thrown at, at the pandemic, we're now starting to see how that all unwinds in a way that... Um, none of us, I don't think, has have perfect foresight on. So it's going to it's going to be an interesting time. I, I would agree with that, John. I, I, I assume we've got some time. I, I see the girls with with Mike. So can we take a couple uh, questions from the audience? Good afternoon, Mr. Goida. Andrew Duncan from the Institute of Public Administration, Australia. Um, we serve the public servants with the information that they need, and so um, I'll be taking your insights and informing our discussion. Thank you for your comments. Um, one of the major factors facing Australia and other developed countries uh, is the ageing society. How do you see that shaping the productivity discussion, yeah. et cetera? It's a, great, it's a great question. For those who didn't hear it, I think it's ageing, the ageing um, and how does that... I was actually talking to someone about that earlier uh, and I think Japan is a great case study of an ageing demographic without um, immigration. And the Japanese economy has been stagnant at best and gone backwards um, as well. So, uh, and, and this is unstoppable, this, <laughs> as, as you well know. Uh, and, and Larry will have his own views on this. So, uh, and, and we're going to have more and more pressures on the public purse through retirements and the health system 
um, because people are going you know, to live for longer, but there'll be consequences for that as well. Um, so how do we get through that? Uh, I think immigration for this country is incredibly important. Getting students back here is such great news. Um, immigration, as I said, um, and not, you know, and, and we have had a shortage of skilled labour and we need to get greater labour availability. But I think the productivity thing is huge. And Gary Banks wrote a really good article a couple of weeks ago, which was published in the, I think it was in the Financial Review, where he, he makes a very, very strong case for um, having to lift productivity. And the things Evan talked about, there's, there's you know, technology is going to help us a lot on that. Um, and embracing technology is going to help us a lot. But as a country, we need to have uh, a mindset around improving our productivity. Otherwise, we will suffer a decline in living standards. And none of us want that. Um, and for many of us in this room, you know, we've enjoyed an incredibly incredible life where our living standards have improved um, generation or decade after decade. Our challenge is to make sure our kids and grandchildren enjoy that same thing, um, not through us uh, spending their inheritance, I think. Thank you so much for your participation today. It's been absolutely marvellous. And a shout out for our West Australian Symphony Orchestra. They're brilliant. Thank you for everything you do to support them. Thanks, Lynn. Now, you briefly touched on this. And my question is, we're great at discoveries in Australia, in universities, CSIRO, you name it. And, but with noble exceptions, we're not good at bridging that gap between taking those discoveries and turning them into industries, processes, or better policies. Israel's really good at it. Yeah. We're not. You're Prime Minister for a day. <laughs> what would you like to see happen, please? <laughs> I think I've walked out after lunchtime. Um, Lynn, it's a great question. Um, and, and you did say notable exceptions. I mean, we've got some rippers in this country, obviously. Um, CSL, Cochlear, uh, incredible businesses. Um, and even look at Macquarie Bank, which is now a top 10 company in Australia, I think, and look at how it's innovated. And, um, and dare I say, even businesses like West Farmers and started as a farmers cooperative back in um, 1914. Um, <clears throat> there's, what's, what's missing? The intellectual firepower is not missing. Capital is, and there's a lot of risk capital required. Um, so filling that void, I think, is really important. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we all want great returns on our investment, but we never want to lose. You know, we're not we're not necessarily good at that risk taking in Australia. I'm I'm going to Israel, and Janine and I are going in. July with Paul Bassett, who was a co-founder of Seek.com with his brother Andrew, and Paul now runs a early startup business called Square Peg, and they do a lot of early startup investing, but a lot of it's in Israel because they've taken that step further. So, um, but businesses like Telstra um, have now have their incubators. Other businesses are looking at that, which I think will be great. Um, and I, I sort of. Lynn, I think we've got to give people like Evan and the people around your table a bit of a licence to um, fail and but fail fast. Um, uh, you know, when I when we took the West Farmers Board to Silicon Valley now probably a decade ago, and uh, we were talking to one of the early fund investors there, and they almost without exception will not back someone unless they've failed. Um, so they, they want people who have experienced failure before they'll actually invest. So I think we've got to tol tolerate failure. You know, we, don't, we actually as a country don't tolerate failure that well. Um, so there's a, there's a bit to do, but it'll be people in this room. You know, I, this is where I think had this... Why is the US such a successful... Question for you, Larry. You know, I've got... Why is the US... How do they keep reinventing themselves? Someone said to me the other day, was because government's completely dysfunctional and they can just get on with stuff. Um, I reckon we want... We ask too much of our government in Australia and that's why I posed that rhetorical question about the Prime Minister because actually, you know, we need to solve some of these things ourselves, not rely on government. What, what do you reckon? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, the one observation I had made 
when, when I came here was that I couldn't believe how deeply involved government was, particularly around um, the innovation sector. Now, part of that is you could argue that the market's broken and there wasn't enough venture capital. But I, I think that you know, in the US, in most cases, I wish they would have gotten a little more involved in banking a couple weeks ago. Um, but I, I think in most cases, the government does stay out of the way. Like, we never, in all, all my years in the Valley, we never really dealt with government. They, they never came, and we didn't really care too much about policy. I think that what's missing to a certain degree in Australia is that we're not celebrating enough. Yeah. You know, we're not celebrating what a success story Paul and Andrew had with SEEK. And um, companies, you know, everyone here, whenever they talk about Canva at a policy level, they want to say, how, how do we lose Canva? Yeah. And it's not the, 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 one of the best, fastest growing technology companies in the world started in Perth. But everybody, instead of celebrating that, the government is worried about how, why do we lose them? How could we, we change that? So I think it's a lot of it's just that um, probably the US and Israel also just values um, an entrepreneur you know, a, a lot more and that there's a sense of heroism attached to that where maybe that's not the case here in Australia mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. I, I would say the other, my other observation is on a relative basis, every day we're you know so much better than we were the day yeah. before in terms of um, innovating and translating IP into to commercial outcomes. I think we're on the right track. How do you feel, uh, Richard, about uh, nuclear power? If uh -huh. somebody decided that uh, they needed to change, uh, there's always a risk in these sorts of things. Um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. I, I'm, I'm not avoiding the question. I'm just trying to be smart the way I answer it. Um, I think we should be looking at all options, frankly. And if nuclear can be proved to be safe and scalable and affordable, scalable by, you know, I think Bill Gates, the work he's been doing has been on smaller scale nuclear. I mean, we're going to have nuclear submarines. Um, uh, I, th you know, and 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 the emissions footprint is as it's meant to be. It, it seems to be something we should be looking at. I would have thought, but um, and and uh, I was talking to someone about this today, and and we wondered whether there's not a sort of a demographic issue here as well. Is it is it is it people my age who, you know, saw the meltdowns in Chernobyl and. Uh, Three Mile Island was it in Three the Mile Island? Three Mile Island in the US, and so it just worried, sick, and and also if you're a bit older, through the 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 Cold War with the Soviets, I, I wonder whether the Lynn whether the under under thirties are a little more bit more sanguine and say actually we've got to solve climate change and we need to do it as fast as we can and. If that's a real if that's a real option, then we should have a look at it. And, and I sort of look at the politics of it. I don't quite get the politics of it because I think Jay Weatherall, who was Premier of South Australia some years ago, had a look at this. I, I might be wrong. Peter Malinowskis, who's the current Premier, I think had a look at it, has encouraged, said we should have a look at it and then got smashed for saying that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm all for having a look at it, but I understand the politics are, are difficult. But I think globally it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think the big challenge with nuclear is we're going to get left behind. I, I, I would agree with you. We have to, it can't not be on the table. And I'm not a big pro nuke. I was out there when I, my longer hair, bearded days, protesting against it for all the reasons. But it, you can't not have it on the table. And I think that's fair. I was actually going to ask you a question, but I didn't want to <laughs> get in trouble with you. Not with you in the room. So, anyhow, well, thank you. I, I'd like to thank invite you. Ian Crawford up. Ian's the deputy chair of the North Perth Community Financial Services and to uh, offer a vote of thanks. Thank you, Richard.